it's healthy to grow our own strengths and mm -hmm. rather than be intimidated by the strengths of others. Having worthy rivals instead of competitors. Competitors are, are other players we set out to beat. But the problem with that is there's no finish line. There are companies that are desperately clinging to their old business models, but this, this marketplace, you know, if you're not willing to pivot, uh, the marketplace will put you out of business. Wanna be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know you're capable of more. You've got Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today let's live your best belief life and learn how to motivate the unmotivated with Simon Sinek. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Grow your strength. Human beings, we can't help ourselves but compare ourselves to others. And uh, comparison is, is the deadliest thing we can do to ourselves because we will always come up short. And right. we'll, it'll, all it does is exaggerate all of our insecurities. Um, it's okay to enjoy other people's success, but you, let them live their lives and mm -hmm. you live your life. Oh, and by the way, they're curating their social media. That's not really their life. <laughs> Um, and so you're making decisions based on how you feel, based on their curated p things. I know, I've talked to so many millennials, I know somebody who's out of work, really depressed, and yet she goes and does all these things so she has the appearance of this amazing successful life. And, and so you met, now she may be making those decisions based on what her friends, oh, who knows what sort of weird, twisted, exaggerated, you know, circle of, of, of depression this is forming. Mm -hmm. So go back to the rules of the infinite game. Your friends are there to admire. Your friends are there to say, God, that I'm so happy for them. What are they doing that I can learn from? I'll give you an example. So we're all, we can all fall into this trap. So you know, in my business, uh, authors and speakers and folks like us, we're all comparing ourselves to each other. And sometimes it can get silly and competitive. And there was, you know, sometimes I go on Amazon and I check the rankings of my books to see that, there's, <laughs> that I still have a job. And, and now and then, there was this one author mm -hmm. who I hated for no reason. <laughs> He's very smart, his work's incredibly good. He's incredibly well respected. I respect him, but I hate him. And I would check the rankings of his books. And when I was ahead, I'd be like, yes. <laughs> and when he was ahead, I was like, Fuck. right? It would drive me crazy. And I had this weird abstract competition. Mm -hmm. Same thing, right? Social media happened to be Amazon rankings. Right. And I would check in all the time. I'd always check in, mine, his, mine, his. Nobody else, just mine and his. <laughs> Anyway, we were, uh, I, sh I was at an event and we were interviewed together on the same stage. Mm -hmm. And the interviewer decided to let us in introduce each other. <laughs> so I went first. <laughs> I had to introduce him. And this is what I said. I looked at him and I said, uh, you make me very insecure. <laughs> I said, uh, because all of your strengths are all of my weaknesses. And every time I see you do well, it just reminds me what I'm bad at. That's how I opened up. He, he turned to me and he said, funny, I feel the same way about you. <laughs> and now we love each other. <laughs> because I realized that he's really good at what I'm bad at, so by me getting to know him and really learning to love him, I'm realizing I'm getting better at those things. And I'm taking more pride in the things that I'm good at rather, think, rather than thinking I have to be good at everything he's good at, right? So that, that it's, it's healthy to grow our own strengths and mm -hmm. rather than be intimidated by the strengths of others. Rule number two, be vulnerable. Okay, so let's be crystal clear. Um, uh, what vulnerability is actually requires strength to do. It requires unbelievable strength to, to, to come into a meeting and say, I'm struggling with this COVID thing. Mm. Um, I'm not sleeping and, and, I, and, and, I, and I fear that I'm not there for you guys. Um, and uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what to do. I mean, that requires unbelievable strength to be able to say that to someone. Um, and so, and so I, let us call it strength to be vulnerable, not weakness to be vulnerable. Um, if, if, um, if we are receiving feedback that we're not being vulnerable, then maybe it's true. And maybe um, our team is, is what they're really saying is please lead us because we feel that you're not leading us. I mean, I think that's an indication. And if you don't know how to do it, 
Um, ask for ask for help. Call people up and say, I know I need to do this and I don't even know the first thing to do. And yeah. start small. You don't have to go crazy. And being vulnerable doesn't mean, uh, you know, like you're talking to your therapist in the in a meeting. It doesn't mean letting it all out. It doesn't mean broadcasting everything. Um, uh, what it means is being honest about the, the daily machinations. Um, it's totally fine for a leader to say, um, I don't know what the future looks like. Um, I have a vision. Um, I think I know what it takes to get there, but I know I can't do it alone. I know it's going to take all of us. Um, I think a very, very easy dipping your toe into vulnerability uh, uh, is COVID, you know, um, to say, I've never gone through anything like this before. And I, there's a side of me that's kind of figuring it out as I go along and I need your help and I need your patience. Um, you know, to dip your toe, it's an amazing opportunity COVID has, has offered because nobody thinks you're weak saying, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you, they think you're being honest. Um, so I think you, you need to start experimenting, um, and you need someone preferably in the company who, who you trust, who can give you guidance. In other words, to, to call them up afterwards and say, how did that go? You know, you know, you need spies, um, to say, is that being well-received? Was I okay? Yeah. Um, and even to say out loud, I don't know how to do this. I'm not good at this. I've, I've never, I used to think vulnerability was stupid and weak and I'm learning that it's, it's an expression of strength and I'm going to experiment with it. Simply saying that is a step to t being vulnerable to simply say, I don't know how to be vulnerable to the team, but I want to try because I know it's important. Uh, that's where I would recommend starting. Rule number three, don't give up. When I was writing Leaders Eat Last, um, I got to the point where I couldn't do it. It was, it was too difficult. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't organize all the information. It was just too complicated. I, I couldn't do it. And I'd been trying for months. I probably missed multiple deadlines. And I was sitting at my, my computer and I decided that I had to give up. I couldn't do it. And so I got up and went for a walk and I was literally planning my exit. Um, I was going through the steps, I was going through the checklist of quitting. I knew that I'd have to give my advance back to the publisher, because technically I'm in breach. Um, I knew that I would be humiliated, but I was preparing myself for it, and that I would get over it. I was also rationalizing that it was okay to quit. I told myself there are thousands, 10,000 books published every single year, no one will miss this one book. And I literally went through the steps to prepare myself for what I had to do to quit. I'm not sure why I did this, but I called a friend of mine who at the time was in the Air Force Special Forces, and I don't even think I said hello when he picked up the phone. I simply asked the question, what do you do when you can't complete the mission? And as is his habit, he just started telling me a story. He was a helicopter pilot, and they had a mission in Afghanistan that was um, a suicide mission. All the intelligence showed that the air defenses were just too great and none of them were going to come out alive. Um, and it wasn't going to be one of those kill Hitler missions where we're all going to die but we'll kill Hitler. This is like we're all going to die and the mission will also fail. And he was preparing his helicopter for this mission um, and his wingman turned to him and said, what do we do? We've got wives, we've got kids, do we refuse to go? What do we do? And my friend turned to him and he said, this is what we signed up for. We go. He asked me, he said, is this book more or less powerful than start with why? I said, the research has impacted me greater. It's, it's more powerful. He says, all right, I'm going to tell you a funny story. Before I met you, I'd become disillusioned with the Air Force and I was going to quit. And I found this kooky little book called Start With Why. And it completely re-inspired me. <laughs> and I decided to stay and I'm a better leader now than I, than I was before because of that book. And if you're saying that this book is more powerful than the first one, then we need this book. He said, this is what you signed up for. You have no choice. Clearly his mission was scrapped <clears throat> at the last minute. The underlying message of this is what you signed up for, you have no choice, wasn't a mean message. The underlying message was, and I will be here with you. 
The underlying message was no matter what, you can call me at any time, I've got your back. And that's the important part. I turned around, went back to my desk, and finished writing that book. Not that night, I mean, it took me months, but... <laughs> but I never thought of quitting ever again. As soon as I knew that someone was there, someone had my, someone had my back. Rule number four, be the idiot. The reality is, I'm an idiot. <laughs> like, and I'm not, being, I'm not being flip about it. Like, yeah. I don't understand very complicated things. And so I ask a lot of questions so that the person who's telling me something complicated, who's talking in terms as if I understand them, sure. finance or neuroscience, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And I ask enough questions just so that I understand it. So is what you're saying this? No, that's not what I'm saying. Well, what are you, so yeah. I, I, we're most, I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. So a long time ago I had a client, they were a, a, a public company and uh, they brought me on, um, to do some work for them, but the, the, they invited me to sit in on a meeting from the consultant that they had hired. Um, and so all the C-level executives and me, and this consultant was giving a presentation about something or other. This is junior marketing. This time. is when I had my little marketing company. And every, all the C-level executives were sitting there nodding and taking notes on the, on the you know, on the PowerPoint that they had printed up in front of them, and I had it as with as well, and I didn't understand a frickin' word of it. Yeah. Right. I was like looking around, like, yeah. I'm, you know, and I, and so I'd raise my hand and say, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> I know I'm the only person in this room without an MBA, but this doesn't make sense. Like you say, A plus B equals C, but based on your logic, A plus B equals D. I, can you just say it again, please? I'm really, yeah. I'm really sorry to slow the meeting yeah. down, everybody. You know, and you could see the consultant getting frustrated with me and would try and explain it again. I said, I'm so sorry. And one by one, all the C-level executives said, yeah, I don't understand it either. Now, if the idiot hadn't spoken up yeah. and said, I don't understand, they all would have nodded their heads yeah. for fear of looking stupid because they didn't understand. Yeah. And it would have, they would have paid a lot of money for a document they didn't understand and they would never have used it and would have sat on a shelf. Um, and it's, it's because I'm, I'm okay being the idiot. Like, that's why I'm not being flip. I'm okay everybody in the room going, oh, because I have to ask questions until I understand it. But the reality is, is once I can get to the point where I understand it, I can get it so simple that I understand it, and I can say it in simple terms, that means other people understand sure. it too. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, it's, yeah. there's a lot of value being the idiot. Also, if you wanna have more self-confidence and self-belief, check out my 254 series where every day for the next 254 days, I will send you an unlisted video. The science says it takes up to 254 days of consecutive action to build a habit. So I'm gonna be with you every step of the way. If you wanna be on for free, 100% free, is a link below. Go check it out, I'll see you there. The skill to hold your opinions to yourself until everyone has spoken does two things. I would rather take the risk of walking out knowing that I might get moved in a way that I've never experienced before, more than just go and have a nice night out and see something that I know is good. Successful measurement, successful recognition is not just for the steps you take. It's not just for the effort, it's that the effort you exerted moved us closer to where we're trying to get to. Rule number five, inspire people. I don't think you can motivate the unmotivated. I, I don't think you can motivate people. People either are motivated or unmotivated. I think you can inspire people. Um, and, uh, uh, and you know, you can motivate people with sticks and carrots, you know, offer them bounty or threaten punishment and you'll get behavior that you want. Is there loyalty? Is there love? Absolutely not. Um, usually when people are unmotivated, it's not necessarily them. It might be the situation they're in. Um, maybe they don't belong in the culture. Um, maybe they feel unseen or unheard. Maybe they're scared. Maybe they're unprepared. So we, we have to, you know, when somebody's unmotivated, let's not label them as unmotivated first. What are the 20 other things that it could also be? Let's start there. Now, are there some people in the world who are unmotiv unmotivated? Absolutely. You hired them, which means you bear some responsibility if it's, if it's time to transition them to help them find another place where they're gonna be a better fit. We can't yell at them and call them stupid and unmotivated and push them out the door. We have to bear some of the responsibility. We hired them. And if we made a mistake and hired somebody who's a bad cultural fit, then we have to take care of them and help them transition to somewhere where they're gonna be a better fit. Um, I think that um, you know, if we only focus on motivating people, and that's a factor, then um, you're only gonna get very finite thinking. An excessive amount of motivating things, like hit this number, get this bonus, 
uh, you'll get a motivated employee pool that doesn't care about each, about each other, might stab each other in the back, and eventually will take a better job somewhere else. We have to inspire people. We have to give them that sense of cause and vision that their work is worth more. Uh, we have to make them feel like they matter and feel like they're seen and heard and understood. And what ends up happening is those people are not only more vote motivated and inspired, but if they're offered a better higher paying job somewhere else, they turn it down because it's not just about the bonuses and the money. It's because they would rather be here with these wonderful people. Rule number six, have worthy rivals. What I recognize was so often in business, we have these competitors, sometimes on our own teams, that we want to beat them. We've all had the experience where one of our colleagues got a promotion and we got upset, we got angry. We got angry at somebody else's success. Think about that for a second. Why couldn't we share in the joy, right? What is it about them that's being revealed in us? That's the problem, right? And so having worthy rivals instead of competitors, competitors are, are other players we set out to beat. But the problem with that is there's no finish line. And so if we're obsessed with beating the other company, then at some point, sure, you're ahead in whatever metric you chose until when, right? At what expense, at what cost? Uh, that's not sustainable. But rather, the other players inside our industry, outside our industry, on our own teams, we can choose our own worthy rivals. Their strengths reveal to us our weaknesses, and by having our weaknesses revealed to us, it means we have the opportunity to grow and improve. And the infinite game, at its core, is basically a game of constant improvement. And so our, our, our worthy rivals reveal to us our weaknesses and our opportunities to improve. Rule number seven, love what you do. That to me is madness. Everybody, the vast majority, should get to wake up and say, I love my job. It is a right, it is a God-given right that we should love where we work. And we should demand it, we should demand that our leaders provide an environment in which we want to come, where we want to care about, we, about each other, where we feel safe to express our vulnerabilities and our fears and our concerns, that we're open to correction and discipline and feedback, that we're not defensive because we know that it's being given to help us improve and grow, and we want to improve and grow. Um, and in turn, we will help others improve and grow because when we feel safe, when we feel that our leaders care more about us than a number, they care more about our lives and our confidence and our joy and our skill set more than some short-term gain, that they care more about our priorities than the priorities of some disinterested external constituency, then we will respond in kind and we will offer our blood and our sweat and our tears and we will make sacrifices of all kinds to see that our leader's vision is advanced and that this company continues to thrive, not for them, for ourselves. It becomes deeply personal. It becomes something we love contributing to. I talk about it all the time. Working hard for something we don't care about is called stress. Working hard for something we love is called passion. And I'm tired of listening to CEOs saying, we only hire passionate people. What, you don't even know what that means. <laughs> How do you know that they're passionate for interviewing and not passionate for working? You know, pa every person on the planet has passion, right? <laughs> we just don't all have passion for the same things. Give me something to believe in. Give me something to believe in. Give me the opportunity to contribute to something. Allow me to make mistakes and try again. And you'll have passion up the wazoo. And rule number eight, the last one before a very special bonus clip is allow positive disruption. This is one thing I got wrong in my book, uh, which is I said that most leaders will uh, either experience an existential flex once, maybe twice, sometimes never in a career. Uh, I never expected that every leader would be facing it simultaneously. <laughs> uh, but the principles are still, are still the same, whether we're all going through it together or not, um, which is it's not about the daily flexibility of business. This is profound 180 degree strategic shift. Um, um, uh, I'll give you my favorite example. Um, in the late 1970s, uh, Apple's already a successful company. They've already come up the success of the Apple One, the Apple II. Steve Jobs is already a famous CEO. And understand, uh, Apple had a just cause. They had a vision, a very clear vision, which is they wanted to empower individuals to stand up to incumbent uh, uh, power. They wanted to empower individuals to stand up to Big Brother, this revolutionary spirit. And if you remember, um, uh, that's what they that's what they stood for, right? The computer revolution. They were one of the mm -hmm. leaders of the computer revolution. Yep. Um, uh, and Jobs and a few of his senior executives, um, as executives do, went and visited another company and they got a tour of Xerox, Xerox Park, which is Xerox's R&D division. And Xerox showed them something they invented called the graphic user interface, um, which allowed a computer user to click a mouse 
uh, and, and move a cursor across a desktop to use icons uh, to work the computer. Now, this is a profound technology because prior to that, you had to learn a computer language. So driven by the, the, the idea that one day an individual will be able to compete against a corporation, Job, Jobs sees this new technology and goes back to his team and says, we have to invest in this graphic user interface thing. He sees it as a leapfrog technology to advance their vision. And one of the leaders who was there that day said, we can't. We've already invested millions of dollars and countless man hours in a completely different strategic direction. If we go down that path, we will blow up our own company, to which Jobs actually said, <clears throat> better we should blow it up than someone else. Well, that decision led to the Macintosh, a computer user operating system so profound that the entire software of Windows is designed to act like a Macintosh. And the reason a computer is now a household appliance was because of their willingness to make that profound strategic shift. And so the reason uh, leaders usually don't make a, an existential flex is because they're too afraid of the short-term losses. They're too afraid of, of the disruption, even if they sometimes see it as necessary. Um, one of my, my favorite examples of a failure uh, was Blockbuster. Blockbuster was the only significant uh, national video rental chain. Uh, you know, they were the 800 pound gorilla. Um, and this uh, little company called Netflix showed up and saw the rise of the internet and the potential for streaming in the future. The technology wasn't quite there yet, but everybody knew it was coming. But they started experimenting with an entirely new business model called subscription. And if you remember, you could get the DVDs and keep them for as long as you wanted with, um, and, and then send them back. Um, and the CEO of uh, Blockbuster at the time went to the board and said, I think we really need to experiment with subscription. And the board would not allow him because the company made 12% of their revenues from late fees. They were so afraid to give up 12% of revenues that they literally committed an act of suicide. Blockbuster doesn't exist and, and Netflix is determining the future of television and movies. Now, the, 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 they will say the internet put them out of business. Nonsense, they put themselves out of business. And so we're seeing that right now in COVID as well. There are companies that are desperately clinging to their old business models, but this, this marketplace, you know, if you're not willing to pivot, uh, the marketplace will put you out of business. Uh, and so we're seeing wonderful uh, 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 disruption happening, positive disruption, taking advantage of COVID to make changes that they see highly necessary, where they may not have made these changes prior because they were just too afraid. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? When you watch a video and you get motivated, the science says you have a 35% chance of following through. That's not enough. <laughs> but when you write down what time, what place, and how you're going to actually take action on it, you jump to 91% chance of following through. And when you have public accountability and you commit to other people that you're gonna do it, it jumps to 95% that you will follow through. So I want that for you, Believe Nation. I wanna know your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. Put it down in the comments below so I can celebrate you. When my career was just getting going, uh, and I was a speaker, uh, which by the way, was not my chosen career. I, I fell into it. Um, uh, there is a, a I, I've forgotten the name of the organization. I think it's called the Meeting Planners Association of America, something like that. We're basically all the people from all the corporations and conferences who hire the speakers, like that's their job. They have their own conference. And so to get invited to this thing is like, it's like American Idol. Like, yeah. Like if you do well, you get a career for the rest of your life because everyone in the room will want to hire you for their conferences for the rest of years. And if you, if you bomb, they all know who you are and you will have no career, right? Like that's mm -hmm. so like, I see where this you know, is going. I'm like, I've done this a bunch now. I'm, you know, I'm relaxed on stage now, you know, I got this, you know, and like, this is one of those events that makes every speaker nervous. And, uh, and it's in this cavernous place. Ironically, it was like the worst venue. It was like, it, it echoed. So you'd stand on the stage talking, you could hear yourself. Anyway, doing my talk, I'm doing Start With Why, this is back in the early days. I got this, you know, done this a million times and don't know what happened. I lost my train of thought. Okay, I, I know this, I've been through this from before. So I went quiet. You usually find my place and then I pick up again. Like I know how to do this. I've lost my train of thought before. I went quiet, 
and nothing happened. I, nothing came into my mind. I had nothing. And now I panicked. And as soon as the panic sets in, now, now all rational thought disappears. And now I start sweating and my heart starts pounding and I got nothing. I got nothing. And I look at my pad and I look at the audience and I look at my pad and I look at the audience. And then I turn to them and say, have you ever had that feeling where you forget what you're talking about and everything collapses, your heart's in your stomach, your heart's pounding, you start sweating, your hands get clammy and sheer panic and they're all smiling. I go, I said, I'm having that right now. Oh. I said, I said, and I got to tell you, it feels fantastic. I said, because I do this so much, sometimes I forget to be present. And I said, right now, I feel completely alive. I said, I feel totally present and totally with this. It's as much as I, as, as crazy it is, this is amazing. I said, okay, I need someone's help. Can somebody please tell me what I was just talking about? Because I do not know what I was talking about. And they all erupted in applause. I got more applause for that than for the actual speech. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, is, is that in every, silver, in every cloud, there is a silver lining. In everything that happens to us, there is goodness. If you want some epic Simon Sinek motivation, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Vision is an internal thing, right? It is the world that you want to live in, right? Jobs was the rebel, and he always was against big business, right?